Kerry said this was the 25th year that many of us have been meeting at Bible Weeks. Prior to that, by the way, Kerry and myself and several others of the team of men that worked together were holding uh, camp meetings that extended as much as six or eight weeks Bible weeks during the summer. So some of us have been at this for 29, 30 years. And I'm so glad that I can truthfully say, I know I'm speaking for all those that serve God together this way, we've never tired of the people of God coming together to hear the word, to be stirred by the spirit, and to move out and advance the kingdom across the nations. Tonight, as I was looking around the auditorium here and the large number of people gathered and then back here on the platform, I can see vast numbers of people who have been saved in this time, who've known what it is to come up under the sound of the Word of God, who have from their first days in the kingdom been exposed to a vital and dynamic message of God's working in our generation. And I anticipate this week being one of great encouragement, great stirring, and a new understanding of what lies before us with the zeal and the dynamic to advance further yet in readiness for the return of King Jesus. Somebody said to me recently, when I was saying that I believed the return of Jesus was very close, he said, Bryn, you've been saying that since I first heard you. And he reminded me that that was over 30 years ago. And I said, well, we're 30 years nearer, aren't we? <laughs> well, I can truthfully say this, I am living and saw these men ministering, we're living in a conviction of heart that we're in a generation that could well see the return of the king and our faith is there for it. I want you to turn with me tonight to Isaiah chapter 52. I'm going to take seven things tonight that I believe are timely to where we are at in our generation. Seven things that God is speaking to the church as we turn a page in our generation, as we turn a page in our experience as a related company together and we look forward to the next lap which could well be the final lap of the great race. We have been blessed by many that have gone before us in the faith for Jesus to return and yet for the church to be ready for that in great splendor. One of the great men of our time, one of the great stalwarts of righteousness and proclamation that has labored with us for years was Arthur Wallace. And he went home to Jesus, but he went home with the faith that God would visit this generation. The night before last, Eileen Wallace went home to Jesus. And she's joined him there. And probably they will have joined the great company of witnesses that watch us run this race and urge us on. For they too went and stood in those ranks with a living faith. Tonight, I thank God that as we approach this scripture, I'm convinced the Spirit still speaks a word of faith to our hearts. Isaiah 52. Awake! Awake, O Zion! Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. O Jerusalem, the holy city, 
the uncircumcised and defiled will never enter you again shake off your dust rise up sit enthroned O Jerusalem free yourself from the chains on your neck O captive daughter of Zion and so the whole thing goes on until verse 7 it says how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation who say to Zion your God reigns listen your watchmen lift up their voices together they shout for joy and when the Lord returns to Zion they will see it with their own eyes burst into songs of joy together you ruins of Jerusalem for the Lord has comforted his people he has redeemed Jerusalem hallelujah Isaiah was an unusually blessed prophet he served the purpose of God in a great generation that saw revival on an unprecedented scale he came to his ministry and calling in the year that King Uzziah died Uzziah was famous because he was a military strategist a benevolent king one that had served Israel well but Israel's confidence was locked into him it was also a time when Assyria was flexing its muscles and going into a great expansionist policy to take over other nations throughout the Bible Assyria always represents the powers of darkness and the enemy seeking to encroach across the world and consolidate its position Assyria was the arch enemy of Israel and when Uzziah died large numbers in Israel were stricken with fear that they were about to be overwhelmed by an enemy power but it was in that time of great crises that Isaiah came into his own and into his ministry he came to serve the purpose of God in that moment of time for standing in the temple he suddenly had a revelation of God high and lifted up and with all his glory and splendor and train filling the temple and suddenly Isaiah knew that it did not matter what Assyria did it did not matter how strong the enemy appeared God was still sovereignly in control and you and I both know we've come to a point in our generation when it almost appears as though the Spirit of God is calling time on our world a world that has not only turned its back on God but it seems a generation of wicked people that delight themselves in injustice and unrighteousness that have taken some of our countries and some portions of our countries and great numbers of our people into unprecedented lows in drugs alcoholism vice pornography all kinds of evils and it seems as though an enemy has flexed his muscle to have one last fling in our world to consolidate what appeared to be his gains but God says when the enemy comes in like a flood God will raise up a standard against him and all over the world the Spirit of God is saying I'm still in control I'm still sovereign I'm still the one that rules the earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof the people and all those that dwell in it God is still in charge and Isaiah went on and saw three great things happen to Israel he saw great repentance in the nation he saw great revival under Hezekiah and then in the chapters I read he saw in the realm of the spirit a day coming that is described as the great day of restoration when God would restore the fortunes of his people restore them to the heights that he had destined them for where the people of God will no longer be a byword and a laughing stock in the world but that the church of Jesus Christ the whole Israel of God would be the people that were raised up supreme 
in the world. He saw this great restoration and he wrote about it. And as he wrote about it, he gave seven great things that would characterize a people moving from their depths of despair and captivity to the heights of dominion and rule and joy. And the first thing he said was this, Awake! Awake! O Zion! I wonder how many people this morning woke up to the alarm from BT to remind you it's time to hit the road. You set an alarm call. You're in a great deep slumber. I, I don't have. My wife knows I have a great antipathy to alarm clocks. I don't like them. I much prefer the inner alarm clock that I set before going to bed. Because the external alarm clock, if I rely on it, I go into such a deep sleep, when it goes off, I'm in the middle of a heart attack. I leap, I think, what in the world? I'd much rather trust that inner one. Now, not everybody can do it, but thank God over the years, God's helped me on that. But awake, awake, can cut in on deep sleep, and that's what's happened here. Wake up, wake up. And the Holy Ghost has been saying it across our generation, year after year after year after year. We've come to a time when the Spirit is saying, Wake up! Wake up! Something's about to happen and you're a big part to play in it. Something's going on and you're part of it. Something is going to be actively at work in our generation that will turn a generation to Jesus and you're many of the instruments He will use for that very thing. He says, Wake up! Wake up to the time you live in. Wake up to the potential that's in yourself. Wake up to the destiny God's got on your life. Wake up to what you can do and what you can achieve. Wake up to the fact you're more than a blob in the kingdom. Wake up you're more than a, a seat warmer in the church. Wake up, O Zion. Come on, wake up. Any amens out there? Wake up. And Isaiah called it out. He said, awake, awake. Put on your clothes. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor. This reminds me of the New Testament where it says, Peter had been arrested by Herod, who was going to do a, the Jews a favor and behead him the next day. Peter, having the word of God and believing that Jesus had promised him a longer life than this, had gone fast asleep in the prison. The angel showed up. And he didn't sneak in to kind of quietly wake Peter, say, let's get out of here. Neither did he sneak over to the guards and lift their keys and let's not clink them together so we can get out of here without waking anyone. It says, while Peter slept, suddenly, suddenly, the lights went on. It says an angel showed up and filled the place with light. God said, let's see what we're doing here. Put it on. This is not a sneak Apache Indian advance. This is God on the move and lets everybody know it. Put the lights on. We're in a generation when God's not doing any sneak operation. He's doing a great thing and people can watch it and see it. It's happening. Lives are changing. People are being blessed. Men and women falling over. Power of God hitting the church. Let's get it all out in the open, says God. Now you'd have thought Peter would come alive with that one, wouldn't you? Instead of that, he's still sleeping. And listen to what it says the angel had to say. Wake up! Wake up! And he said he struck him. Got hold of one of his wings and went, take that, wake up! <laughs> and listen to the next line. Put your clothes on. Thank God he said that before moving out. <laughs> Put your clothes on. Nakedness is a shame. Ever since the fall. And God speaks to Jerusalem here. He says, wake up. Wake up. Church of God, wake up. And put your clothes on. Clothe yourself with strength. 
and put on your garments of splendor. Now I've mentioned to large numbers of you in recent months and so have these other men that we do believe that there's a turning of the page in our own activities and ministries in this country and beyond. We believe that we're moving in to a new phase. And I've been asked again and again and again and again, what do you mean by a new phase? What do you think is going to be different? Well, God had spoken in our hearts and said, this will be the time of the sons. Somebody said, well, that's a great answer. What do you mean the time of the sons? I didn't know myself when God said it. But I want you to turn back to chapter 49 of this book where God explains it to us. Isaiah, in the, in the beginnings, by the way, just look at this, listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he's made mention of my name. And then he goes on explaining how God formed the servant of God to bring Israel back. And so we're dealing here with the restoration of the fortunes of the people of Israel and Jerusalem, which is the church and all those that trust in Jesus Christ. And we come to verse 8. If you've got one of those Bibles that subdivide your chapters with little headings, the heading in this, the NIV says, Restoration of Israel. Verse 8. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances to say to the captives come out and to those in darkness be free they will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill they will neither hunger nor thirst nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them he who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up see they will come from afar some from the north some from the west some from the region of Aswan shout for joy O heavens rejoice O earth burst into song O mountains for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones now as Israel's listening to all this through the prophet they think what in the world is God talking about Verse 14, but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. God's reply was, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Isn't that lovely to know your names are there? Your walls are ever before me. Verse 17, listen. You are sons, hasten back. And those who laid you waste, depart from you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your sons gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people. And those who devoured you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Then you will say in your heart, who bore me these? I was bereaved and barren. I was exiled and rejected. Who brought these up? I was left all alone, but these, where did they come from? This is what the sovereign Lord said. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Can plunder be taken from warriors or captives rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. 
I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, they will drink on their own blood, as with wine, that all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now, I'm going to interpret that passage very quickly to you because it is significant when God says, put on your garments of splendor. There's an argument going on between Israel and God because God has said, I'm starting restoration. I'm going to bring your sons back. I'm going to bring your daughters back. And Israel said, what are we talking about? I have no sons or daughters. When did I bear these? I've been in bereavement. I've been cut off. I'm under your judgment. I've had barren years. Nothing's been happening. Ours is a generation in which there's nothing taking place. Oh, God says, that's what you thought. But amongst the nations, the Gentiles, I've been doing something. And kings and queens of those nations have been like foster parents to your children. I've been giving birth to sons and daughters amongst the nations of the world. And I'm going to bring them all back in you. You won't even be able to hold them all. There'll be too many. But I'll bring them back. And you who were called barren, you won't be called barren anymore. Look what you've got. Now I want to say this, the generation before us in this nation, the generations before us in many of the nations of the world, were under a judgment of God. There have been long years in which the churches of our country have been a laughing stock, have been written off as finished. In which sometimes wholesalely the people have talked of us living in the post-Christian era. In which they've said the church belongs to the Victorian times. And the church because she played fast and loose with the word of God. And because we did not walk by the principles of God's word or hold to what the spirit said. But we made all other kinds of, of rulers and governors over us all. We went through a period in which soul salvation was skinny on the ground. But then God called time on it and said it's time to restore. And a generation has been born which I can only say this, we're living in a time of great restoration. And God says around the world, I'm speaking into the nations of the world all over the place. Do you know people are being born again today faster than any other time in memory? Large numbers are coming into the kingdom of God. In some nations, the percentage-wise is already up beyond 20, 25, 30% of a nation has been born again. Do you know why? Because God has called time on the devil, time on a generation that turned its back on him, time on the world, and I believe God's turning the fortunes in this land as well. We've come to a point where the Holy Ghost is saying, I'm going to cause sons and daughters to emerge. They'll be born again. When people wrote you off, you're not written off. When people said you won't bear fruit, you will bear fruit. When people said your day is over, they're going to find that you've awoken again. And the power of God is with you. And the presence of Jesus is with you. And men and women, boys and girls, will be born again from drug addiction. Born again from alcoholism. Born again from where they were. Filled with the Holy Ghost to overflow it. That's where we're at. This is a chapter in which the sons will rise up and take the gland. I want to say to you, stand up all those under 25 years of age. Look at this. Wow. Let me take it a generation. Stand up all those under 30 years of age. See? You can sit down. You can sit down. Stand up all those of us young in faith. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Do you know what God is saying through Isaiah to Israel? He is saying to the church, the holy Jerusalem of God, he says, wake up. Put on your strength. And reckon this, put on the garments of splendor. That is, make room for the sons and daughters that have been born as ornaments to your bridal attire and put them on. Make room for young people, young men, young women to take their place in the kingdom and in the power of God at this time. 
And that's what we're looking for. I'm telling you, we turned a chapter. If Jesus could choose a bunch of 12 disciples still in their teens to turn a world round, get ready for elders that are still in their 20s. Hello. Get ready for men and women in callings of God that are still young in years, not just young in faith. Get ready for men and women to be moving in the power of God, in the power of God on this generation. Get ready for the harvest more than you've ever anticipated, more than you even planned for, more than you dreamt of. Make sure you're there where God is, because that's what's going on. Put on your garments of splendor. 49 again, go back with me, 49, Isaiah 49. And look at verse 18. And he's talking now to the Jerusalem that thought she'd been forgotten by God and nothing's happening, nothing's before. And in 18 he says, lift your eyes up, look around. All your sons gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, you will wear them all as ornaments and you will put them on like a bride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not good enough to be a generation that says, oh, that's for the youth meeting. Nor are we going to turn around and say, well, young people enjoy themselves that way, they'll grow up one day. Nor are we going to turn around and say, well, you know, they praise that. I know it's a bit over the top, you know, but young people are OTT an awful lot, aren't they, really? But it's all right. As they mature, I'll tell you, if they mature in the attitude that some people talk about maturity, what you really mean is as they go wrinkled and griped up like a squeezed over lemon. We're into a generation in which all of us that are over our 20s and over our 30s and over our 40s got to rediscover the faith that's a dynamic faith that moves with the power of God to take our generation. Let me go on. Verse 2. Point 3. I say that for all who sit in my homiletics class. I have my points, you're safe. Shake off your dust. <laughs> Talk about a Rip Van Winkle. Jerusalem went to sleep, so deep asleep, for so long asleep, that dust collected over her. She's gone to sleep in bedraggled old garments. She just about staggered to bed in a worn old nightdress or night attire of some sort, pajamas or whatever. And while she slept, dust collected all over her. Now she's being told to get up and put on her garments of splendor. But God doesn't want the garments of splendor put on over all this old dust. So he says, wake up, put your garments of splendor, shake your dust off. I was going through one of the boxes recently that we've given to just in case up in the loft. And uh, <laughs> while going through it, I found a, a little trustworthy old camera. The last time I'd taken photos of it, don't, I mean, get ready for the shot, but the last time I'd used this particular one to take any photos, we were down in Guyana, which is over 30 years ago. So I get it up, it is covered in dust. You open, I don't know how the dust even got in. You open the shutter, it's all over the shutter. So I thought, oh well, it's finished. It'll be rubbish now, no good. Because you get a little bit of dust in there, it's going to be marked up on the film. But I'll give it a shot. So I got the little blower out and cleaned off and <laughs> marked, get it all lovely. I'll try with a roll of film, which we did. And they all came out perfect. There was nothing wrong with the camera underneath the dust. You just got to get the dust off. That's all you got to do. 
Do you know how many of you, when you got born again, he made you so lovely, so perfect, there's nothing really wrong with you. You just need to shake the dust off. That's what Paul meant when he said, now are you clean? Washed, sanctified. Then he goes on to urge them to live sanctified. He writes to those that are perfect. And then a few lines on, he says, not as though we were already perfect. I think this man's a schizophrenic. He's not at all. What he knows is this, that in the eyes of God, you're perfect. You're complete. You're righteous. You're cleansed. You're whole. He said, well, I don't feel whole. I don't feel perfect. You know, I'm glad you think I'm great, like, but... I'm not really that great if you knew me too close. I tell you, the only thing wrong with you, you need to shake that dust off. Dust does not settle on that thing which is alive and moving. It's when you settle down and you go into sleep and you don't even twitch, you fossilize. If you don't carefully you stay down there too long, you turn into dust. But God says to Jerusalem, rise up, shake the dust off. And I tell you, it's time in the realm of your prayers, in the realm of your asking of God, in the realm of your releasing of faith, in the realm of your testimony and dynamic witnessing to the lost, in the realm with which you move out to save the lost, it's time to shake the dust off. It's time to really mean what you're doing and get with what God is doing. It's time to really stir yourself up. Oh, have you ever been in one of those dusty prayer meetings? Where it's all settled down. You don't even know anybody's alive. Long silences. And then at last a prayer. Oh God. <laughs> you who made the heaven. We're in your presence tonight. Save the lost. Now I thought it said, the fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Not the sleepy prayer of the half awake or the half dead. It's time to shake the dust off. It's time to pray proper. Let me say about all of you in churches that relate with it, we know what, where it's at. Listen, the reason lots of people don't pray out in prayer meetings, they're not. Now train yourself to pray. Get provoked in prayer. Don't worry you've not heard your voice before. It, it'll be alright, just speak it out. You may shock yourself, but God will say, wow, I always wondered what your voice was like. <laughs> speak it out. So when you pray, shake up the prayer meeting. You know, don't sit there and join the dead with your own dead thinking. See, a lot of people are professional critics of the prayer meetings. They sit there thinking to themselves, this prayer meeting is dead. I don't even know why I'm here. These people don't know how to pray. My Lord, what a prayer meeting this is. Well, it is if you're like that. The way to change a prayer meeting that's like that is to pray yourself. And to pray in the way praying should be done. With passion. With zeal. With a heart on fire. With a love for God. With a compassion for the lost. Shake the dust off! You're going to witness to the unsaved. You know, there are so many thousands of Christians that escape sharing their faith with this idea, it's my life that speaks. Well, your life's as dumb as your mouth. <laughs> very, very few people convince somebody to get saved by the way they live. Because many Islamic peoples, many Hindus, many Zen Buddhists live exemplary lives. That in terms of character and behavior, many of them are hard to fault. 
If it was a case that people would be persuaded by just the life, I wonder, would they join Islam or Christianity? Jesus never ever did say, you shall be the surest forth of a life. He said, you shall be witnesses to me. And if you want to know what kind of witness, the Bible says, how can they believe if they've never heard? How can they hear if nobody doesn't tell them? We've got to have some verbals to our faith. Shake the dust off. Inside the context of fellowship in the church, it's time to shake the dust off and, and get a living fellowshipping, a dynamic fellowshipping together. One in which I'm thrilled to see you, bro, in which we don't engage in whole evenings or afternoons or hours in just murmuring together, but in fellowshipping together. And then he says, rise up. I like that. The prodigal in the pigsty. When he came to himself, he said this, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say this, I like that. He's got a plan, he's got a determined plan, he's ready to do it. And the next line says this, so he got up and went. Thank God for those who say I'm going to get up, but thank God more for those who get up. I recall when my father worked in the coal mines years ago and he was on the catching the very early morning bus now to be down the road at half past four some days and this kind of thing for a colliery bus to pick them up sometimes I'd hear my mother's voice say Selby it's time to get up and I'd peep and I think wow he's cutting it close I'd hear him say, I'm going to look no. Then I'd hear it just a few minutes before it's time for us, Selby, it's time to get up. And I'd hear him say again, I'm getting up now, woman. <laughs> but all were relief when he stopped saying he's getting up and he got up. How many know you can't catch the bus with the words, I'm getting up? You get up to catch the bus and all the large number of people who, who've been in conventions and conferences and they've heard about rising and they faith I'm coming up well come up then oh see oh I'm gonna believe God then believe him it's like Dave Mansell often used to say as people would pray and they would say oh Lord we we want to love you we want to worship you and Dave would say well go on then Stop saying what you want to do and do it. You don't walk into the house and say, Sweetheart, I want to kiss you. <laughs> you kiss her. The number of amens that go across the gathering when people say, you know, a preacher will say, We are the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. We need to stand up and let people know. Amen. We need to move with the power of God and cast out demons. Amen. Well, do you know what you need to do? Go and do it. Rise up. And some of you need to come up on the inside this week. To rise up out of a slough of despond. To rise up out of despair and discouragement. To rise out of unbelief and murmuring. To rise up and say, hey, enough's enough. I'm born not to be horizontal in life. I'm born to stand up. I'm born to move in the power of God. I'm born to be not just a believer but a believer who does what his faith is actions it rise up look at the next words 52 verse 2 rise up sit enthroned oh Jerusalem I like it 
Shake off your dust, rise up and sit enthroned, O Jerusalem. Do you know why I like that? Because it is the opposite of what was true for Babylon. Babylon, which was the counterfeit. Babylon, which is the city against God. Babylon, which is the world, its systems and its religions, contrary to God and his kingdom and his church. Babylon, it says, is brought down to the dust. But Jerusalem is said, rise up out of the dust, shake it off and sit enthroned. You were not born to be beaten by your circumstances. You were not born to fall to every temptation. You were not born to find the world has dominion over you. You were not born for the devil to drag you down and pull you down through whoever he uses. You were born to reign and rule in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that when he saved you, this is what he did. He quickened you. He raised you up. And he made you sit in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? From now on, you're always looking down on your problem. You're always looking down on your circumstance. You're able to handle it and tackle it and meet it and conquer it and cope with it from a position of strength enthroned in his presence. The Bible actually says, says Paul, as he writes to the church, he said, we reign, we rule, we reign in life. I've got to say this. You know it's true, you were born to be a winner. Isn't that right? How many of you really know you were born to be able to handle life in a victorious manner? You're born to be a winner, right. Then I want to say to you, stop letting the enemy put any other thinking lower than that in your mind. Stop saying I can't. Stop saying I'm not able. Stop saying I'm insufficient. Stop saying these things that pull you down below the challenges of life. And whatever you are facing in life, whatever is the challenge to you personally, in your domestic situation, in your economic situation, in your job situation, in your church situation, in your world situation, whatever you're confronted by or whatever you are confronted, you know this, that greater is he that's in you than he that's in that world. That you can face it and you can do it and you can win. Because you're born to win. Paul didn't say we're running a race at the end of it, we might break a tape. He said run to win. I like it. I was watching, as many of you have watched, it's hard not to have watched the Olympics in the last few weeks. And prior to one of the major events, they were talking with different individuals that were participating. And I noted one athlete. They spoke to him and they said this, and he was in, a, in, a, in the, <coughs> I think it was 400 meters or one of those type of races. Short burst sprint deals. 200, 100, whatever it is, 10 yards if it's me. <laughs> He's in for the run. And the fellow said this to him, he said, what do you feel your chances are? Here's his answer. Well, he said, I'm not pretending I don't think I'll get the gold or silver, but I am hopeful of getting the bronze. I thought, son, you've just lost. You never run for bronze. You always run for gold. If you happen to miss the gold, you've got the silver. But you never run for bronze. You always run for gold. And I want to say, he never, he didn't come in the, in the league at all, by the way. He wasn't anywhere near the bronze. See, running below the challenge of the race. Running below what the mind can lay a hold on. Every one of you, born again, 
You need to go for what God has destined you to be and run for gold in it and for nothing short of that. He said, well, well what you taught? I'm saying, if you're going to run to be a good husband, be the best husband. Run to be the best wife. Run to be the best son or daughter. Run to be the best preacher. Run to be the best elder. Run to be the best of deacons. Run to be the best you can ever be in whatever you're going for. You run for gold. That's what Paul talked about. He talked about one day when it's all over and you see the king and you'll hear from the king, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul said you run in such a way that at the end of it all there's a crown for you. The apostle John on the Isle of Patmos as he wrote to the churches and brought the word of the Lord to them. He said don't let anyone seize your crown. In this next phase we're going for, you are the sons and the daughters. I'm saying, listen, until now you've listened to this platform of men. You've had these men preach in your churches. You've got, the, you've got the deacons you've got. And you've watched them and you've helped them and all that. But I'm giving you a new challenge. It's the challenge to sons and daughters. Now it's your turn to rise up in what God has made you. To rise up with the anointing God's put on you. To rise up with the gifts God has put in you. And run for gold. And go for gold. Go to achieve yourself now. <laughs> Sit enthroned. Listen, the next one, number six. Free yourself from the chains on your neck. Who are like that? Free yourself. Well, the picture here is this. You don't tell somebody to do what it's impossible to do. They had within their own power the ability just to take the chains off their neck and throw them away. How many of you know the devil's a big fraud? Yes, he is. Well, Jesus described him as a liar. Not in the last couple of years, but a liar from the beginning. He's also the father of lies. Jesus didn't mince words. He didn't say he's a fibber. He said he's a liar. He didn't say, and a lot of fibs come from him. He said he's the father of all lies. And one of the lies he tells you is this. That that thing that's troubling you has got you bound. You're chained. I thought I was born again, but I'm bound by it. Mm -mm. I'm going to make a suggestion to you that if God says free yourself you weren't bound by it you bound yourself to it and the moment you say oh enough of that you can take the chains off and throw them away how do you break a habit drop it simple as that Gee, it's too easy, Brother Britt. It isn't too easy at all. It took the last drop of Jesus' blood. It wasn't an easy thing. But don't tell me that when Christ's blood has been totally poured out and his life went into death and he was raised from the dead for you, that you're still bound and you've got somebody else got to do something for you that Jesus wasn't able to. yourself from the chains on your neck a young man came to me I've said this in one of your churches recently but a young man came to me quite recently and sat and wanted to counsel and I said well what's wrong he said well I'm in a mess I said what's the problem he said I'm troubled by demons I said in what way he said, they keep filling my mind all the time with unclean thoughts. And I'm into stuff that I shouldn't be into. I said, I say. I said, well, what do you want? He said, I wondered if you would pray for me and cast them out. Hmm. I said, well, let's, let's just do one or two other things first, huh? I said, answer me a few questions. What kind of videos do you watch? 
suddenly there's guilt all over the face. Well, you know, that's part of the problem too. I, I watch some of those that I shouldn't watch, I said to say. What shelf do you buy your book magazines from? Top shelf or third shelf or bottom shelf or guilt all over the face again? Yeah, well, I am into some magazines I shouldn't be into, as you see. When you're by yourself and in the dark, what clubs do you go to? Guilt all over the face again. You know, how many of you know that we're either blaming the devil a lot for things we are responsible for ourselves, or we're trying, to, trying hard to get him involved in our wrongs. Years and years, people have blamed the devil. He says, free yourself because it's in your power to stop doing certain things that could often mean your total deliverance. William Hartley was a divine healing evangelist with the Assemblies of God, a very fine man, righteous man, upright man, and moved in the power of God. And I recall going to his meetings in 1957. And I'm in this meeting, first one of divine healing I'd ever been in. And there was a big tall Irish friend of mine with me. He had chest problems. You know, one of these breathing chests. <laughs> but we're in this meeting together. And Tom was one of these who liked to macho man, you know. So he's got one of these shirts on opened right down almost to his belly button to show his hairy chest. <laughs> so when Bill Hartley calls for the prayer line, down goes Tom. Stands there. Now I knew he was out there for prayer for his chest again. For healing. So he could breathe well. So Hartley comes along and said to him, what do you want? And Tom said, I have these chest problems I get a lot of chesty colds and about a rough time this week so Bill Hartley puts his hand on his head I always remember this it stays, stays with me now he said Lord give this man the money to buy a tie and the wisdom to do his shirt up <laughs> that he passed him on <laughs> Tom was furious I had about from that particular meeting about two miles to walk home and I'm, I'm walking Tom home. I thought I better walk him home as well in case he does something stupid so I'm walking home. all he's got this big umbrella he's swinging it around what about this evangelist and what kind of man of God is he and all kind of thing because the man had prayed the prayer not of deliverance but of common sense. How many people's deliverance would be effective if they'd use common sense? Put your chains off! If you don't mind me saying it, sometimes not the chains that you put on yourself. Sometimes it's the expectations others have put on you and you've allowed them to. Sometimes it's what others said you should be. Or what others said you could do. And you've limited yourself to that. It's time to put it off. An illustration I heard some recently. And it stayed with me from a man called Les Brown. One of the motivational ministries of our time. <clears throat> he spoke of the pianist in a, a lounge in a hotel. On the east coast of the United States. The pianist was playing and it was superb playing, beautiful music. People used to come just to relax in the, the lounge area of the hotel and just listen to this musician play. Then one night, one of the men there just turned to him and he said, Hey, he said, sing something for us with it. He said, I can't sing. He said, come on. He said, you can sing, sing something. He said, no, he said, I'm not a singer, I'm not a vocalist, I, I'm a pianist. After a while, the man got a little disgruntled. He turned to the bartender and he said, Hey, he said, ask him to give us a song. The bartender turned to him and gave him the magic line. Sing something or you don't get paid tonight. Yeah. 
And Les Brown records how the pianist began to play and then he started to sing. And no one ever sang Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa like Nat King Cole. It was in him all the time. He had to let it out. He just didn't think he could. And probably others have probably said he couldn't. And he had taken somebody else's chain at the chain of his own unbelief about it. Didn't recognize it as there. I can't. I'm just a pianist. And then finally, he threw the chains off and started to sing. Nobody knows Nat King Cole for piano today. Though he's a great pianist. But what he's known for is singing. It was in him all the time. I wonder what's in you. I wonder what's in you. It's time to put the chain off. It's time to free yourself. And number seven, in verse seven, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who say to Zion, you God reigns. I want to say this to you. It's time. Shake off. Wake up. Shake off the dust. Put on your clothes. Rise up. Sit enthroned. Throw away the chains and proclaim the good news. This chapter we're moving into, the sons and the daughters will bring the good news. You'll proclaim it. You'll do it. You'll put your hands out and heal. You'll speak the word and set free. You'll bring salvation and light into the darkness. You'll be able to bring them along into the community of God, baptize them. You can walk them through in discipling. We're going to grow and grow and grow and grow as you move out. As you what? As you move out. Out of what? I'll tell you where. Out of the Christian ghetto. Out of the comfort zone. Out of the silent witness. Out of the prayer meeting. Out of the church building. And you move out to where you proclaim on the mountains of this world's need. The good news. The good news. Now later as we go through this week, we will spell out in detail, stage by stage, step by step, what we're going to be doing over these coming years in which you're part. But it starts here. Wake up. Wake up. I wonder how many will be part of what God does. It'll be those that have woke up. It will be those that have shook the dust off. It will be those that have put on the good garments. It will be those that have thrown off the chains. It will be those that have risen up and sit enthroned. It will be those proclaiming good news. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Stand to your feet with me please. Thank you Jesus. I know this has been a day in which many of you have driven hundreds of miles. Many people are still on the road and coming in. Some people still pulling caravans. But right at the start, before any minds could just get overtaken with the tiredness of it all, you've been alert to hear. You've heard a voice say, wake up. Do you need an angel wing to clip your ear? Or are you going to wake up? God's lights are on. I want you as we pray, I'm not going to ask for any appeal, come forward or nothing like that. I just want you for a moment to pause and I'd like you to turn in prayer right now as I say a few things. I want you to ask yourself, are you fully awake? Am I fully awake? Am I alert? Have I put on... The garments of strength, have I shook off the dust? Am I alert to my prospects in God, to the potential of God's power in me? Am I awake? Am I alert to what the Holy Ghost is doing in me and can do through me? Am I alert to the challenges of my time? Am I alert to the promptings of the Holy Ghost? Am I alert to what can be effective in this generation? Am I alert? Wake up. Shake off the dust, put your garments on. Rise up. If you woke up, now rise up. That is inside yourself. Say, wow, I'm going to make my life count. 
I am born for this time. I just didn't happen to be. I'm ready, God. I'm born for this time. Rise up in yourself. Sit in throne means this. Tell yourself now, I'm not going to be limited by what I presently know I can do. I'm going to discover what I've never ever done. I'm not going to be limited to the finances I've got. I'm going to move in a faith that will lay hold of finances I haven't yet got. I'm not going to be limited by what others say on me. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to move on and I'm going to step out and I'm going to achieve because I'm rising up to sit in the throne. I won't be ruled by another. I'll be ruled by Jesus in this. Take your chains off. Free yourself from your unbelief, your depressions, your moods, your downers. Free yourself limitations of friends that are no good for you free yourself free yourself from an inability to look to the future because you've bound yourself to your past free yourself let the past be past close the door on it some of you you've made your mistakes you've got if every time you look back you look back at that mistake you look back at that weakness that failing Free yourself. If you've repented and God forgive you, free yourself. Don't carry it around. If Jesus says it's gone, then get rid of it. Throw your chains off. Why live again with the dead thing? It's gone. It's time to step out and proclaim the good news the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Reigns in your life, reigns in your mind, reigns in your body, reigns in your experience. The Lord reigns over the world around you. The Lord reigns. Father, we say thank you tonight. That we've reached a time in our generation where we sense the Spirit is calling the church into a new phase of restoration. Where God, we break out of our churchianity and our fossilized Christianity and we break out O oh God from the inhibitions of fear and we break out O oh God of the corral of unbelief and we learn to ride the winds with you we spring as the heart upon the mountain we rise up and we say I will sit enthroned God thank you for a generation before us that we can win a generation in which you've given us an opportunity in which you've thrown it at our feet and say go proclaim the Lord reigns heal the sick cast out devils baptize the believer see them filled with Holy Ghost thank you father I pray for every young man, every young woman. I pray for everyone young in faith here tonight. Lord, let this be more than just a week in which we'll celebrate and enjoy. Let it be a week in which we'll rise up and we'll move in a faith for these things. Thank you, God, for a generation that will turn this generation towards the Lord. There's never been a time like I this. Got this year.